So please just uh, give a big round of applause for Austin Dacey and Christopher Hitchens. Good evening, Christopher. Shalom. <laughs> you write in your book that you only attend synagogue to go to the uh, bat or bar mitzvah of a friend or to debate the faithful. So I, I think we've discovered... Yeah, I don't do circumcisions. <laughs> I don't do genital mutilation. Yeah. <laughs> You'll, you'll never find a secular humanist uh, moil. Difficult to reverse. Never by crackling from a moil either. Now, I've been asked not to be too sympathetic with you. Um, <laughs> Bring it on then. <laughs> I don't know if your choice of wardrobe is, is helping or hurting. You know, um, I'll tell Mrs. Thatcher once wore the same dress to a, an evening where the, Her Majesty the Queen was, and she sent a letter around to the palace the next day saying, perhaps we should coordinate in the future so that we don't do that. And the Queen wrote back to say, Her Majesty doesn't notice what other people wear. There's <laughs> room for only two queens at one time. You're welcome to it. <laughs> Now, in keeping with not being too sympathetic, allow me to just get this out of the way. Um, as an aspiring writer myself, who, who strives for eloquence and, and pertinence and um, public appeal, I want to tell you, and I, I think I probably speak for others here in the audience, just how much I will always hate you for putting me to shame. <laughs> now, Hitch 22. We know what a catch-22 is. What kind of a predicament is a hitch-22? Um, hitch-22 is a borrowing from my late friend, Joe Heller, uh, of a paradox, uh, but in a minor key. Um, I say towards the end of the book that um, having had various loyalties and commitments and allegiances in my life, very few of which I'm ashamed of, um, I've arrived at a position which is shared by, I think, a fair number of people here, and now has almost, is almost known as a faction in American culture, international, actually, of people who are sure only of um, being unsure, who are certain really only about the uncertainty principle, who, in a Socratic way, if that isn't too arrogant, are most impressed by how little we know we know, and indeed how little we know about so much more and more, and who are, if you like, adamant for doubt. And that might sound like a soft option, I suppose, but in fact it's not, um, because this, this catch, this hitch, 22, is a commitment against all the forms of modern totalitarianism, which are made up of those people who already have all the information that they need. Um, who think that maybe one book could be enough, uh, who believe they have the truth, in fact, believe it's been revealed to them, who think they're already qualified by their own definition to tell other people what to do. And so that com the commitment against that form of totalitarianism, which is principally, if not exclusively, theocratic in our time, is, is the cause of my life. And it's what I learned in the rest of the book. The rest of the book just leads up to that. Adventures in Poland at the beginning of Solidarity, or Zimbabwe, or Argentina during the reign of the death squads, all these other things, North Korea. All of these are the ways I found out for myself that whatever your other positions are, they must be consistently anti-totalitarian. That's the original enemy of humanity. 
and in fact was original in its theocratic form too. So that's the idea. I was wondering if the title also owes to a word game that you've played with many of your friends, um, Salman Rushdie, uh, Martin Amos, and others. Yes. It does, as a matter of fact. There were various rude word games and some slightly more elevated ones that we used to play just to try and build some linguistic muscle. You know, all these things are uh, useful. Always look to the language. Um, one of the games that Salman involved, I'll, I should probably skip the rude ones unless anyone wants to ask me about them later. I know people don't come here for smut or filth. Um, <laughs> but a game that Salman invented was uh, titles of books that didn't quite make it um, to the publisher. Um, the Big Gatsby, I remember, was one. Um, uh, for Whom the Bell Rings. Um, <clears throat> good Expectations. Portrait of a Woman. Uh, that was mine, actually. Um, uh, Mr. Zhivago. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Tim's Cabin. Um, you see how it goes. And one of them was Hitch 22, and I remember thinking I might need that one day, and I think I can work out a means of uh, fashioning it. Two days in the life of Ivan Denisovich. Salman was also the master of naming Shakespearean plays after the fashion of uh, Robert Ludlum style novels. Yes, I mean, they have a whole chapter about Mr. Sir Salman, as, as he probably shouldn't be called. He's the only person I've ever forgiven for accepting a knighthood from Her Majesty. Um, Mr. Rushdie has a whole chapter in my book, the importance of him, his work, and the stand he took for free expression against um, theocratic barbarism, um, is rightly regarded as a master of the language. And once asked by an anti-Ludlam fan who, anti, uh, not an anti-Ludlam fan, an anti-Ludlamist who didn't just dislike the books but couldn't stand the titles. I, mean, I can't even, they're so bad you can't even remember them. The Iger Sanction or the, the Born Inheritance. Like, you know what it's like. Um, he was asked, well, what would a Shakespeare play sound like if it was um, written by Ludlam? Or what would its title be? And we, I promise you, with no more notice than I've given you, he was asked, what would Hamlet be? And he said, uh, the Elsinore vacillation. <laughs> um, and I thought, I thought, you can't do that twice, man. I admire you, though I do. And I said, what about Macbeth? I said to him, he said, the Dunsinane reforestation. <laughs> and we went through the, the Rialto sanction, um, the kerchief implication. Um, quite a By the way, one of the, bad, one of the titles that didn't make it was Romeo and Julie. <laughs> Come to think of it as well. He's, um, it always amazes me uh, that his first language is not English. He, he, he owns the language like no other writer, as no other writer does. Uh, but his first language is Urdu. Um, astounding thought. Well, congratulations on the book. You, you write so beautifully uh, about your life. Um, although, then again, you were blessed with exceptionally good material. It's, it's an exceptional uh, life. You seem to have been at all the wrong places at the right time. Uh, whether it was planting coffee at a communist uh, work camp in Cuba, to being paddled by uh, Margaret Thatcher, yeah. and always, always surrounded by this glittering uh, cast of characters, Rushdie, Edward Said, Ian McEwen, uh, Martin Amis, James Fenton, Susan Sontag, Paul Wolfowitz. Wolfowitz. And it strikes me that, that Catch-22 is, above all, a story a friendship, a story about loyalty to friends and loyalty to causes and about the testing and the shifting of those loyalties. And one of those, of course, um, is religion. You are best known these days as an enemy of religion. Um, and you say in your memoir that as a convinced atheist, you ought to agree with Voltaire that Judaism is the root of religious evil, as it is 
the root of these monotheisms. And yet you go on to find much to admire about Jewishness. I was wondering if I could ask you to read uh, that section uh, to give the audience an idea of what I'm talking about. Okay. Oh, yeah. In her preface to his um, collection of essays, The Non-Jewish Jew, uh, Tamara Deutscher, widow of the great Isaac, relates the story of how her husband, a future biographer of Leon Trotsky, studied for his bar mitzvah. Considered but the brightest boy in any yeshiva for years gone by or for miles around, he was set to speak to the following question. Somewhere in the looped intestines of Jewish law, there is mention of a, of a miraculous bird which visits the world only at intervals of several decades, and then only very briefly. On its periodic landings, it delivers and leaves behind a beak full of bird spit. This avian drool, if you can seize hold of even a drop of it, has wonder-working properties. Now comes the crucial question. Surely you saw it coming. Is the bird spit to be reckoned as kosher or as treif? <laughs> the boy Isaac spoke for several hours on the rival theories of this dispute and on the competing commentaries on those rival theories and, of course, on the commentaries on those commentaries. He used to say later that such onerous mental and textual labor did not serve to train the mind at all, but rather, like the rote memorization of the Koran, stultified it. I'm not sure that I agree. Much of my Marxist and post-Marxist life has been spent in apparent hair splitting and logic chopping, and I still feel that the sheer exercise can command respect. It may even build muscle. Yes. Thank you. I think I do think that still. Um, it's the, an extraordinary number of secular and atheist philosophers. Um, Spinoza would be a very good example, would be the classic one, in fact, had that kind of rabbinical and orthodox training that I believe does change um, and help to shape the mind positively, partly because Judaism does one particularly good thing. It educates people in what the heresies are. It teaches uh, students about Hellenism and how to avoid it, um, about the awful temptations of being an apikuros, the, the, the Jewish word for a heretic is apikuros, epi means epicurean, student of Greek philosophy. You, you've already aroused their curiosity. It's going to be very hard to do that and then repress it. And so I think it's probably not an accident that the the Jewish people are, are probably the most self-emancipated from religion of any of the mono, monotheist or post-monotheist groups. And after all, it's the least we, uh, so to say, we can do, because we invented this curse of monotheism in the first place. The least one can do is emancipate oneself from it and then point the way for other people to do the same. You say we. Well, um, by Mosaic law, and by Israeli law, and by the Nazi party's Nuremberg laws, I would count as a Jew. I don't have any very great respect for any of these laws, but if it means anything, yes. I mean, my mother's family is from that rather <clears throat> dubious bit of the frontier between Germany and Poland, where Helen Thomas thinks we should all go back to live. <laughs> um, every time that border shifts, as you may have noticed, a catastrophe ensues uh, for civilization. It's not just bad for the Jews when the German-Polish border gets moved. It's bad for everybody, including Germans and Poles and Russians and everyone else. Um, and I have a chapter in my book about going back to this awful shadow land to try and see if any of my ancestors survived, which, of course, none of them, none of them did. Um, the survival of the Jewish people means a lot to me. Now, as you just pointed out, this, this critical dialectical method, this skepticism, really, that you identify as a Jewish characteristic, it has at least as much claim, as you say, to be a classical Marxist or a Socratic yes. characteristic. Why the loyalty to Jewishness as such? I just think that, uh, look, all monotheisms, Rus Russell is right about this all religions are equally wrong and in the same way because all of them involve a surrender of reason to faith. And that's a terrible danger and an insult to one's own self-respect and, and to the only faculties that make us different from other primates. Um, Judaism, 
at least does not proselytize. It doesn't care whether other people are Jewish or not. It used to. There were times when it was more proselytizing. They're, they're horribly recorded in the Old Testament. Jews don't proselytize now, except among other Jews. Um, so that's an advantage. Um, Jews don't make the ridiculous mistake of saying the Messiah has already arrived. I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> um, in other words, all you need to do is tune your ears to get, pick up the good news that's already been swirling around for 2,000 years. Um, and so on. And, it's a, and the, there's a dialectical training in Judaism that I think is useful. That's the furthest I want to go on that, I think. But I think I would have said that in any case, even if I had, because for most of my life, I didn't know that my mother's family was from Poland. Um, it was a family secret, and my mother wanted me to pass, and wanted herself to pass. Wanted me to become an English gentleman, so you can all be the judge of how well that worked out. <laughs> and so I, didn't, I don't feel, no, I don't think with my blood, I don't think with my genes, I, I, and I don't like people who do it. But I feel I owe a little bit to the tradition, you're all the same. And, uh, and when the survival or security or dignity of the Jewish people is in any way threatened or in question, I, I hope I would take it personally anyway. A Jew until the last anti-Semite dies. Yes, at least, yeah. Now, another area in your life where you say you've uh, kept uh, two sets of books, two accounts, um, two lives, indeed, um, is in the area of your, forgive me, your sexuality. Two, two sets of date books, in fact, um, some for uh, males and some for females. You write um, a fascinating description of the same-sex um, activities, the exuberant bisexuality um, of your school days, uh, and, and some interesting goings-on uh, at Oxford as well. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you might read a little bit of that. Well, I can remember it, actually. <laughs> Please. I can, <laughs> I can do it. Um, I hesitated a bit about putting that in, but I thought I would for this. I thought, one, it would be probably interesting for you to read about life in a series of institutions in a country where bisexuality is almost mandated. This is actually not very common. And it's not... And it's no longer the case. I mean, all that's over now in England, and those boarding schools are all co-ed and so forth, and I wish them joy of it. Um, but I, th I thought, well, since I'm a member of the last lot of boys who had to go through this monastic uh, hothouse, I might as well set it down as it was. And then I thought the other reason for putting it in, apart from what I hope might be intrinsic interest was, and as illustrating my divided self, is that um, there are people still who want to criminalize homosexual or bisexual behavior, consider it a disease or a disorder. And I thought the least one could say was that I learned this much anyway, which is it's not just a, a form of sex, it's a form of love. And as such, it deserves respect and protection. And it's amazing how this very obvious point still hasn't been <clears throat> taken up uh, properly or enthusiastically. And I think the argument would be better conducted if more heterosexuals like myself admitted what I know to be true in the majority of cases, actually, that they've all been a little bit gay at one time or another. We'd be better off if that God was honestly said, I think. So I said it as salaciously as I dared. <laughs> I have to say, uh, it feels as if it happened to somebody else, but, but that's the point of writing a memoir. And while, while the good Mr. Hitchens is, is too modest to read it, I can assure you it's very good, and you should get the book and read it for yourselves in the privacy of your own home. <laughs> you write movingly about your affection, love for Martin Amos, uh, which you even suggest would have grown to be more than merely friendly um, had it not been for the fact that Quote, my looks by then had declined to the point where only women would go to bed with me. 
Well, again, I felt I had a duty to history there because, um, not to speak necessarily too critically about gay life, but there's a narcissistic element to it. Um, and, and I think it's, it's overwhelmingly, more than any other kind of sexuality, is dependent on being young. Is that what you say, you're glad not to be gay? Yes, because I, wouldn't, I don't think I'd want to be old and gay somehow. I hope I don't upset anyone needlessly. Um, yeah, I, 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 I almost even felt at the time, this is, as it were, not me, but, um, but it'll have to do. Um, and with, um, with close male friendships, uh, such as the one I've had all my life with Martin, um, I once or twice had to ask myself, is it possible to have a heterosexual relationship with a, with a, with a guy? And the answer is, no, it isn't. Um, but I thought it was worth trying. Um, and the solution to it was to have a very long dialogue, which I try and reproduce, about the wonders of womanhood. A very, very, very extended, very intense, very comp complex, very awe-inspired, um, ongoing chat about the female mystique. Yeah, that, was the, that, was the, that was the best way of doing it the straightest way of doing it. And what, what were the results? Well, there's a very squalid result, um, which I have in the book, but I don't know if anyone would want me to read it. No one wants to hear what it's like going to a massage parlor with Martin Amos, do they? <laughs> it's not this kind of audience. I could do a bit of it if you like. <laughs> but I don't know where it is. It should normally fall open at the same There's no index here. <laughs> if I can find it quickly, I'll do a stave of it. Do you want to ask me something while I look? I mean, you wrote the thing. Um, you, second identity. In the chapter where you answer the Proust questionnaire, yes. you say um, that you admire most in men the ability to think like a woman. Um, Yes. You also, you also say that you have been invited to all of the, uh, the female-dominated uh, literary salons in Washington, D.C. once. Yes. <laughs> That's a borrowing from what um, Oscar Wilde said about Frank Harris, that he was invited to all the great salons of London uh, once. But it is virtually true of my Georgetown life. I found the bordello scene, if you, if you want it. We want it. No, now I've lost it again. Damn, sorry, I had it in my hand. Um, go on with the, so yes, with anima, as Jung called it. I mean, I, I admire women who can think like men and men who can imagine what it's like to think like women. And I'm sure if I, if I could have one wish, it would be to spend a little time being female. Um, as long, I think it would have to have the option of reverting. Uh, but I'm, yes, I'm, that's what I'd most like to know, is what it's like to be female. I think it would be time well spent, even if it was time spent away from American womanhood, as it were. All right. In the midterm, I thought we were going to talk about secular humanism. <laughs> no. Sexual humanism. In the midterm churnings, in the midterm churnings of what was to become his breakout novel, Money, Martin required his character to visit a brothel or bordello. He even had one all picked out. Its front name was the Tahitia, a dire Polynesian-themed massage parlor on Lower Lexington Avenue. And you, he informed me, are fucking well coming with me. I wanted to say something girlish like, have I ever refused you anything? But instead settled for something rather more Butch, like, do we know the form of this joint? I could not possibly have felt less like any such expedition. I had a paint stripping hangover and a sour mouth, but he had that look of set purpose on his face that I well knew and also knew could not be gainsaid. How bad could it be? Pretty damn bad, <laughs> as it turned out. Of the numerous regrettable elements that go to make up the unlawful carnal, carnal knowledge industry, I should single out for distinction the look of undisguised contempt 
that's often worn on the faces of its female staff. Some of the working hostesses may have to simulate delight or even interest, itself a pretty cock-shriveling thought. But when these same ladies do the negotiating, they can shrug off the fake charm as a snake discards an unwanted skin. I suppose they know or presume that they've already got the despised male client exactly where they want him. As it happens, this wasn't true in our case. I would gladly have paid not to have sex at this point. <laughs> and Martin needed only to snap his fingers in order to enjoy fe female company. But the cynical little witches of the Tahitia were not to know that they were being conscripted into the service of literature. It was well said by Jean Tarou in The Plague, I think, that attendance at lectures in an unknown language will help to hone one's awareness of the exceedingly slow passage of time. I once had the experience of being waterboarded and can now dimly appreciate how much every second counts in the experience of the torture victim, forced to go on enduring what is unendurable. But not even the lapse of time between then and now has numbed my recollection of how truly horrible it was to be faking interest in someone who was being paid, and paid rather more incidentally than I could afford, to feign a contemptuous interest in me. The multiplier effect of this mutual degradation gave me dry heaves and flop sweats, and I began to fear conveyed the entirely misleading impression of my being a customer who was convulsed by the hectic sickness of lust. It was the cash question, though, that saved me. With some presence of mind, I had for once preempted Martin in the bar of the dump where the gruesome selection process began by swiftly pointing to the prettiest and slenderest of those available who also possessed one of the most vicious-looking smiles I've ever seen on a human face. <laughs> Once removed to her sinister cubicle, we commenced to bargain, or rather in a sort of squalid reverse haggle. Every time I agreed to the price, she added some tax or impost or surcharge and bid me higher. Clad by now only in some sort of exiguous sarong and equipped only with a dank Ziploc bag, containing my credit cards and money, one was obliged to check everything else before entering the humid bar, I wearily started to count out the steepening fee, which was the only thing in the room that showed any sign of enlarging itself. <laughs> I don't think I can bear to do the rest, but the thing, the reason I, the reason I, the reason I, put it in was actually that is the most Proustian moment in the book. And remember, there's a lot of bordello stuff in, in Marcel. But it's Proustian in this sense. Um, I learned from it that time can really be regained. If you, if you go to the end of that chapter, it, it's, um, it gets much more squalid. But then you need to pick up a copy of Martin's um, novel, Money. Um, and I even have the page reference in there for you. And see what a marvelous fictional passage he wrought out of this dross. It's the, it's the best attempt I've ever taken part in to turn base metals into gold and to recover what was a totally wasted morning and lunchtime and make it seem, after all, to have been worthwhile. So In Search of Lost Time is still my favorite book of, um, of A La Recherche de Tourne Perdue. It can happen, but the, the price can be steep. It certainly is some of the most uh, pungent language in the book. I was wondering where the showers are. Oh boy, there's something playing right on me. But what really struck me about that was that apart from the staff of the Tahitia and um, Susan Sontag, um, appearances by women in the book are really quite fleeting, with the great exception of your mother. Why there's, is that? Well, there's Mama. That's not nothing. Um, there's Jessica Mitford, who is in some ways, the, in later life, was the mother I never had. There's, there's quite a lot about Susan. Um, let me think, who else? Um, Rosa Luxemburg, of course. Um, These are not people who are members of your circle. Rosa Luxemburg wasn't, no. That's not my fault. Um, George Eliot, um, I'm trying to think of the people, if you mean writers of females of interest, it influenced me who I couldn't have known. I would certainly 
give her as my favorite, favorite, much most revered novelist. Um, and I think there are some general non-specific or non-named homages to the feminine, if I could say that for myself. There are homages to non-named females, yes. There was a rather nasty review in The Guardian, I think you remember it, which contains the following passage. When the invasion of Iraq was first debated, one couldn't fail to notice the preponderance of left-wing men of a, of a certain age who came out in support of the war, radicals as adults, but often from conservative backgrounds, now beginning to confront their own mortality and preoccupied by masculinity and legacy, their palpable thrill about military might suggested that deep down they secretly feared progressive principles were for pussies. Now here was their chance before it was too late to prove their manhood. Yeah, that's not even good as an example of what it is. Is it? I mean, in other words, it's very, very uh, insipid uh, pop psychology. And it's clearly written by someone who hasn't bothered with my chapter on Iraq, um, which is a long one, maybe longer than people want, but it describes the experience of having been going there since the middle 1970s when Saddam Hussein first seized power and going through the experience of war and fascism um, and genocide uh, in Mesopotamia, and concluding finally that civilization wasn't compatible with the continued private ownership of Iraq by a psychopathic crime family that was, for example, willing to, not just willing to, eager to, and did do, uh, blow the wellheads off the pumps of the Gulf and flood the whole place to a Gulf of Mexico extent on purpose and then set the rest of it on fire in defeat after the evacuation of Kuwait in 1991. The, the, the sheerly evil, sadistic, psychopathic nature of, of um, unlawful power, the wish to see that combated and defeated has, I think, very little to do, practically nothing to do with the shrinkage of my own um, gonads or whatever it is. She, she may be, she would be accidentally right if she, if she guessed this, which she didn't. She could be coincidentally right, but it would only be by coincidence. I say in the chapter on my father, who was a very morose, very conservative, very reactionary, very pessimistic, a lifetime Navy officer, that though I thought he'd been exploited by the Navy, the Crown, the monarchy, the empire, the establishment, <clears throat> he'd been a very brave fighter in the war against Hitler and had, in a sense, been beached and abandoned downsized when the war was over and had nothing to show for it. And though that had a big influence on moving me to the left, I, I don't by any means despise the, the martial virtues that he had, the, the, the bravery and the sense of duty and uh, um, valor. In fact, you regret in the book that you feel you lack the courage to take up arms in the struggle against tyranny. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Johnson says, Every man thinks of himself meanly if he hasn't been a soldier or, or been to sea. In fact, I, which is how my, the form in which my father's soldiering occurred. I actually don't think that. I would only think meanly of it if I would have been able to do it and had shirked it. But actually, I knew about myself when I was quite young there was no possible way I could be a soldier, let alone spend my life on a ship. I just, so it wasn't that I could have done it, but I shirked the duty. I just wasn't born to do anything like that. So I don't feel I've funked it or do dodged the draft, no. I, what I have, though, is I have a great re respect and admiration for people who can do it, as I do for people who can be revolutionary guerrilla fighters and so on, with whom I spent a lot of time, people who are willing to lead a life of clandestinity and permanent danger and risk torture and so forth, full time. I've seen enough of that also to know that I couldn't do it. Now, your father, your father was not a man of the left. He was not. 
he was very much not. He was from a very Baptist family, um, very Hampshire, south of England, conservative peasantry, people who were brought in to build the Royal Dockyards in Portsmouth and then to serve the Navy. And uh, he actually, I think he rather gave up on his, his early, very early strict Baptist upbringing. In fact, I think I know that because there's an anecdote that I don't put in the book. I wish I had. When I was young, he used to make breakfast for himself very early in the morning. My mother didn't like to get up early. My father was, was, was making strong tea and baked eggs down in this old kitchen range by himself and reading the Daily Telegraph. And I thought, I wasn't an early riser either, but I thought one day, I thought it might be nice to go down and have breakfast with the old man. He might like it. So in my pajamas, I padded down. And there he was with his Tory newspaper and his eggs and tea and so on. I said, good morning, Daddy. And he looked at me and said, Jesus Christ. He said, there'll be family prayers next. <laughs> and, and from this, I learned two things. Well, I learned one thing. I'm not doing that again. And I guessed another thing, which is what his family life probably had been like with his rather tyrannical old man, where they did have family prayers. And I also realized he, he'd spared me all that. He never tried any of that on me. I'm not a religion victim. I might as well mention it now. I was never injured or upset or abused by it. I have no, no grievance against it of any kind. In fact, I rather, you know, I rather enjoy talking to religious people and studying their books and their works and so, even attending their services as long as they don't involve gentle mutilation or human sacrifice or anything like that. And so what was it that drew you to the left in, at an early age? Well, partly it was the time in which I was born. I was born in 1949, so by the time I was old enough to think about anything, there was the, the ending was occurring of a very, very long period of conservative rule in post-war Britain. And the other thing that was happening was the, the final end of the British Empire. There were, various, there were still some brush fires going on in the colonies in places like Cyprus and Malaya, um, in which my father's service was involved. And so and I generally felt myself on the other side of these wars. I was, I was for the insurgents. Um, and I thought, it was, why, did, why did they go on fighting over the empire? It's obviously over. It's ridiculous. So I began to formulate anti-conservative positions like that on my own. And then I suppose when I was about, when I was mid-teens, I became aware of the insanity of of things like the nuclear uh, menace and the possibility that, that there might be a, a thermonuclear exchange over Cuba, that I might be killed because of President Kennedy's ego. I thought, this is absurd. This is wicked. I had hardly started my life. This guy thinks he could risk a nuclear war because he's messed up his Cuba policy. It very much angered me, I remember as did everything I read and could find out or, or see on the TV about the war in Vietnam. So I was sort of, I was the perfect age to be around in 1968. And that was a very, very shaping year for me. And I write, I hope not too great length, about what, to try and recall to people who don't remember it, or who do, uh, what that was like. The feeling that I wish everyone could have once in their lives, that you're youngish and you were actually living in a revolutionary moment. The world could, could really change on its axis for the better, and you could have a part in that. It's a great feeling. So not just left, but revolutionary. And this, you say, is um, due to the influence in large part of a man named Peter Sedgwick. Yes. Whom you met by chance in the winter of 1966. Yeah, I was introduced by Peter Sedgwick to a, the left within the left, um, which I'm sure some people here have had some experience of. In other words, n not being a member of the Labour Party, which is a kind of very traditional social democratic, rather establishment party, and never having any temptation at all to join the Communist Party, because again, if you were brought up, when I was brought up, you, you knew about the Hungarian Revolution, for example. Um, before you knew about the Bolshevik Revolution. I mean, you, knew, you saw the consequences of communism before you studied the ideals of it. And I was in Cuba, in fact, when the Red Army invaded Czechoslovakia. So there was ne never any temptation in that direction. But there was a sort of red thread that, that did go back to before the Russian Revolution, which is um, 
exemplified in the names, anyway, of Leon Trotsky, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Victor Serge, uh, C.L.R. James, very important influence on me, the great uh, Trinidadian Marxist author and also great writer about cricket, who, whose book Black Jacobins is the history of the, the only real history of the slave rebellion, the creation of the Second Republic in, the, in this hemisphere, the, the Republic of Haiti. Um, with the Toussaint Louverture. This was a tradition that they don't teach you in school. And what it meant was, which is also very useful for me, and not unlike some of the Talmudic disputation, is that all the, all the most interesting fights are within the left. It's revolution within the revolution all the time. You, you never can evolve a safe position that you just hold and promulgate. It's a continuing struggle. That's what I liked about it. Speaking of the left within the left, I read <coughs> Hitch 22 alongside this book, An Opposing Man by Ernst Fischer. Mm. If you could say a word about Fischer, you've called his autobiography one of the greatest of the 20th yes. century. Yes, I recommend it in the book and I recommend it to you. Ernst Fischer was an Austrian who, um, I'll try to see if I can condense this, he witnessed the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the First World War in which he'd been a soldier. He saw the collapse of um, post-war Austrian democracy in the face of fascism. And he saw the repeated refusal of the liberals and the social democrats to fight back against Hitler and his proxies in Austria. And having seen that and realized that it was probably final, he decided to go to Moscow and join the hard line of the other side. And um, that's where he made his big mistake. He became a pamphleteer. He became a pamphleteer. Not unlike yourself in your Oxford. He days. did. Um, he did the broadcasts from Moscow in German that uh, Stalin had broadcast to the advancing German soldiers, telling them to surrender, <clears throat> that if they carried on, none of them would get back alive, that they'd been betrayed by their insane leader, Adolf Hitler, that if they didn't leave Stalingrad, <clears throat> they would all die there, that they should instead surrender, shoot their officers, join the Red Army, and build the World Revolution. That says, Pretty good broadcast, as a matter of fact. Uh, quite muscular, quite pithy. Um, but he, he also came simultaneously to understand that Stalin himself was building a, an absolutely hateful and ruthless dictatorship that was, in, in the end, killing all of Ernst Fischer's friends if they even said a word out of time. So it's a tremendous, it's, a, it's called an opposing man. It's a terrific record of, of having to keep two sets of books in the, in the midnight of the 20th century. And by the time he sat those down... Are the people, those people are the kind of gold standard to me. People who managed to do that mm -hmm. and survive with their principles intact. Well, I'd like to talk about his principles. I mean, at the moment he was sitting down to write this, um, I think you were, you were probably on your way to, to Cuba or you would be there soon. Um, he talks about the, the, the tectonic effect on his thought of... Um, of uh, the invasion of Czechoslovakia, yes. saying that in Czechoslovakia we had seen that socialism is possible, and y then just moments later we had seen that it was impossible. You had a similar um, yeah. realization when you were in Cuba. Yeah, I went to Cuba um, in the summer of 68 because the, there was a work camp that had been opened for young revolutionaries in Pinal del Rio, and the Cuban government basically said, if you can get through the blockade, if you can get to the island, you can come to this camp and we'll show you the revolution, which was then very young. I mean, Guevara had only been murdered a few weeks before. Um, the, the word was out that was, this was a new kind of revolution. It wasn't like going to East Berlin or Warsaw or something. And we were all keen to see if that claim was true or not. Um, and it could be a small thing or it could be a big one. I mean, in my case, it was a small thing first. Arrived at the airport, got there on some bucket shop charter flight, greeted by sexy young Cuban comrades, music playing, frozen daiquiris handed out, welcome to Cuba. It was not a bit like crossing the Berlin Wall. So, thought, well, maybe this is good. Then they said, can we have your passport? Yes. Then after an interval, another daiquiri said, okay, can I have my passport back? No. Why not? Well, we keep that for you. We take care of all that for you till you leave. I don't like 
to be separated from my passport. Well, you are separated from me. That's up to us, not you. So instant feeling, no, I don't like that. Um, micro. And then, well, we, everyone knew there was going to be a fight between the Czechs and the Russians. And I thought the Russians were going to invade Czechoslovakia. Um, but no one was quite sure whether Castro would support it or not if they did. I thought he would. When it came to it, he, he supported them very enthusiastically, much more than he had to. It wasn't just a pro forma thing. So it was quite useful to me to be that way disillusioned that young. Um, uh, if you see what I mean. It's, disillusionment needn't be negative. Well, the mood, the, the, the trying to live without illusions is a very important. Mm. The mood of an opposing man is, I think, one in large part of, of disillusionment. It's, it's sober, it's searching, it's a painful uh, self-interrogation and confession. He, he, he dredges up a pamphlet that, that he wrote called Dis Destroy Trotskyism. Um, yes. Uh, while he was observing the, the show trials in Moscow. Um, now he said some terrible things on Stalin's behalf. And, and, I wanna, he did, and he did try and atone for that. I want to read you him reflecting on sure. uh, his pamphlets from 36, 37. Today, after 30 years, I force myself to read what I wrote then, confronting my recalcitrant memory with the printed word. If I voluntarily subject myself to this torture, it is not for the purpose of self-mortification, but in order to determine the lengths to which a man can go who, though neither stupid nor vicious, deliberately ceases to see, to listen, to think critically. Now, in Fisher's judgment, he was willfully blinded and corrupted by power. Yes blinded by his hatred of Hitler, and he, he concludes uh, this arresting chapter with this arresting sentence, even that realization does not suffice to exonerate me. Now, you, by contrast, write that you hope and believe, quote, my advancing age has not quite shamed my youth. Nice. You uh, describe your break with the Trotskyist left um, by saying it didn't so much, I didn't so much repudiate a former loyalty like some attention-grabbing defector as feel it falling away from me. That's more or less right, and I, I shouldn't exempt myself from self-criticism there. I mean, if I, if I ask myself of the time I spent on the left, is this, I, haven't, I haven't anything to atone for that the sort that Fisher did actually being a convinced Stalinist, and, he, and he, as he rightly says, not even the fact of being anti-Hitler will, will exculpate you from that. But I can remember something, and it comes back to me occasionally very vividly, which is that I was quite friendly with the Zimbabwe African National Union, Robert Mugabe's party, during the time of white rule in colonial Rhodesia, as it was then called. And with other nationalists too, and revolutionaries there. And I'd spent quite a lot of time there during the independence war and so on. And, and I knew a few things about Mugabe and his entourage that I should have made more of now that I think about it. And that when I asked myself why I didn't say more about it, it's almost certainly because I didn't want to, as they say, give ammunition to the enemy. I, I, I thought it was high time that Southern Africa was liberated from, from white colonial rule, and I didn't want to put a spoke in the wheel. And of course, now I feel terrible about that, because well, I feel terrible. Who cares what I feel? But I mean, the, it's, not about my, it's not a parade of my feelings, but the, the way that so many of my bravest friends in that movement have been killed and tortured and exiled by Mugabe would be to say that, you know, that, that would be to say enough, I think, about why I'm ashamed of that. And what about Trotsky? Is and again, the fact that the motive was supposedly a good one doesn't, doesn't get you out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that your motives were pure, that you, you could justify it to yourself, that it was in a good cause. That, that makes it worse, of course, because that means you're defaming or you're disfiguring a good cause, and that's what one mustn't do either. 
What about Trotskyism? In, in response to your line that um, you didn't repudiate like some attention-grabbing yes. defector, uh, Theodore Dalrymple, reviewing Hitch 22 for First Things, wrote... First Things, yeah. I never know whether that magazine's called First Things or Last Things. It could be one or the other. Quote, I had not realized before that the author was so averse to attention, nor does it seem to have occurred to him that a defector might just wish to draw attention to his defection because he had come to the conclusion that his previous commitment was dangerous and evil. Well, here I have to put myself in the hands of the audience or any other audience who might read me or follow my stuff. I mean, if it, if it would seem to people that one took up or dropped positions for effect, or say, or, or adopted or um, abandoned causes according to whim, just so as to have something to say or something to write about, then if, if that's what I, if, if that's the impression I gave, it'd be too late to change it now. I actually don't think it is the impression I gave, even to my own ears. Um, and the, so the way I propose it is this. Everyone does contain contradictions. Everyone does change their minds. Everyone does have to handle mutually exclusive positions or um, promptings. The, the question is whether they realize that they're doing it or not, it seems to me. That's the test. So no regrets about devoting much of your adult life to defending Marxism? No, absolutely not. I still think like a Marxist. I still think he's one of the best, uh, most original um, critics of religion. It was one of the first things that drew me to him. I'm not a, I don't call myself a socialist anymore because it seems too much like an affectation. Um, but is it true? What? That you're a socialist? No. Um, during all this, I'm talking about the long, drawn-out torture of the Iraq debate. During all this, I never quite lost the surreal sense that I had become in some way a pro-government dissident and that of all the paradoxes of my little life, this might have to register as the most acute one. But it was the demonstrators in the streets I was teaching at Berkeley for much of the first spring of the Iraq War who struck me as the real conformists of the scenario. Accused of becoming a sellout by working for the interwar Yugoslav Republic, Rebecca West's guide and covert lover Constantine in Black Lamb, Grey Falcon confesses that yes, for the sake of my country, and perhaps a little for the sake of my soul, I have given up the deep peace of being in opposition. Yeah. yeah. The deep peace of the opposition. The deep peace of being in opposition, yes. I think that for a lot of people, their self-respect almost depends, and often the self-respect, the, self the, the reputation they have, say, in front of their students, depends to an extraordinary degree in what they would probably call not selling out. So that long after there's the smallest chance of them being anything like a real revolutionary has completely evaporated and they've, it's become totally manneristic. That's the one thing they couldn't give up. They would feel that they'd wasted their lives doing that. And I, would, I find that many of them are wasting their lives by not doing it. Isn't there also... And, and yes, after the incredible assault on our civil society in September um, 2001, I found myself perfectly able to see um, the world from the viewpoint of the policeman. And to feel that it was in some way a responsibility to be able to do that. And say that uh, people who are looking for um, reasons to blame the United States for this are being at, not even frivolous, I mean not even flippant, um, are being contemptible. And yeah, if I, if I knew how to help the authorities, I would. Um, and I would, I'll go further and say that of, of, my, of the students I have and younger friends, people have maybe advised or the most idealistic ones I know, and the most intelligent as well in many cases, the toughest minded, have, have decided to join the armed forces. I never expected that I'd be saying this either. And are guarding us while we sleep and actually fighting against the theocratic fascists. Rough men at the ready. Good. Thanks.
Thank you. And you found your deep <coughs> peace now in opposition to something else, and that is theism in particular, yeah. Islamism. Um, now you're sticking it to the man in the sky and <laughs> his, his viceroys on earth of theocracy. Now, well, it strikes one me has no I, choice. I mean, they, they impose themselves on us. Uh, I've, I've, I, I would like not to know what His Holiness the Pope believes or what his theology is. I, I'd like it to be a private matter between him and his God. He won't let me do that. <laughs> he insists on imposing it. So I have to know his pathetic beliefs and I have to know their, their wicked consequences. If, 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 I was a, if I was a Muslim and I thought, look, there's one book that says that the Prophet Muhammad has brought us all the truth we need and that if I adopt his precepts and I follow some very simple steps, I'll get to paradise. Suppose I believed such a contemptible, pathetic thing. Wouldn't it make me happy? Shouldn't it make me happy? It doesn't seem to make them happy. <laughs> Why doesn't it make them happy? They can't be happy until everyone else believes it too. I should say that's a very bad sign of a pathological insecurity, among other things. And so, no, until they agree to leave me alone, I'm not going to give them any peace. No. It strikes me that the, the, the cause of uh, defeating theism and the cause of defeating Islamism and defeating theocracy might not be the same. In that, many of those on the, the front lines of this struggle against Islamism and theocracy are themselves believers. Um, in fact, they're often the first to be persecuted under such systems, the, the Baha'i or the Copts of Egypt, for example, yes. who are denied equal citizenship, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community sure. of Pakistan who are, who are persecuted under its blasphemy laws. But they're not organizing under the banner of atheism. They're not fighting for unbelief as such, but for freedom of belief. Do you think that atheists risk uh, trading efficacy um, for the deep piece of opposition to theism? Well, so that I, I, I exactly see the, the thrust of your question, but um, there are people who will uh, look out for Copts. Other Copts, for example, will. For the Ahmadiyya Muslims, for, <coughs> for the persecuted uh, Shia, or for those who are persecuted by the Shia. Um, these quarrels don't involve me, except, or shouldn't, except that they do, because they want to bring these quarrels to our streets. Uh, they're, they're after all, that we're not being attacked by the Muslim world. We're being drawn into a civil war within the Muslim world, actually several civil wars within it, um, which is great, deeply offensive um, and very dangerous. Uh, in these circumstances, since I only have one voice and one life, I'm not going to say, well, can't we all get along? Because at first, I know we can't. And second, I think that the only correct reply to this cacophony of competing theisms is to say how much better and more beautiful and more satisfying and more moral is the view that we are not created but that we are evolved, that we are responsible for ourselves and to others, um, that, we're in, that we're one species and that these differences are trivial when they're not vicious, and that the only form of liberation consists in thinking for yourself and that we'd be better off not being afraid of a celestial dictatorship of any kind. Now, that's what I think. And I, people say, well, wouldn't it be better if you made a bit nicer? I'm sorry. No, I don't think that it would. Um, we have to hold up the, the whatever, what is invariably a better alternative. And also be aware that if the, if the others had the whip hand, if, the, if Egypt was a Coptic majority society, Muslims would be persecuted in it. There's no question about that. Now, it was over differences in your stance to Islamism um, that you and Edward Said 
began to drift apart. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Yes, well, Edward was a secularist to his core and had never been a Muslim anyway. Um, he was one of the, what was once a very large Palestinian Christian minority, and of that, a member of a minority of it because he was an Anglican. The most Palestinian Christians are Greek Orthodox. Um, but he was an Anglican from, Jer from Jerusalem. Um, and he didn't like Islamism at all, but he couldn't bring himself to criticize it except as a manifestation of something else. In other words, if there's a Shia theocracy being set up in Iran, it's only because the West supported the Shah. True, but only half true. If Hamas is a problem in the Gaza Strip, which he was very quick to see that it was, totalitarian racist party making quite big strides, well, that's because the Israelis sometimes encourage it as a means of breaking up the PLO. True, but only half true. He couldn't bring himself to criticize it except, so to say, instrumentally. He couldn't criticize it face on and, and in its own terms. And I began to find that was a, a refusal of the main, of the main uh, question. But still, you said that he was family to you, as all friends oh, yes. are family to you. Well, actually, friends are God's apology for family, is what I say. So what was it that finally ended the friendship? Um, he, he reissued his book, Orientalism, um, on its, I think, 25th anniversary in paperback. And I, I was asked by the Atlantic Monthly to review it. And <clears throat> in the course of this, he said that he believed that the United States Armed Forces had deliberately destroyed the Iraqi National Museum on the first day of the occupation as a means of depriving the Iraqi people of their cultural patrimony and reducing them to status of colonial beggary and servitude. And I thought that was an enormous amount of untruth to pack into such a short statement. I just couldn't take seriously anyone who would say something so wickedly untrue. So that and a couple of related matters meant that we, we couldn't speak to each other as civilly or as warmly as we had before. He, he accused you of writing something racist. Well, he didn't do that. He didn't quite have the nerve to do that. But he quoted something in a Saudi, he wrote a piece for a Saudi rag in London, in which he, he alluded to various remarks Un uncited as having a racist character to them. One of these remarks had been made by me. He had the grace, I like to think, not to accuse me of being a racist, but I, I take that word very seriously. I, I presume that someone who thinks you might be a racist doesn't want to be your friend. I mean, that would certainly be my view. So that was another cause of froideur, yes. So it would have been a cause of chaleur or heat if he had accused me of that, but he he didn't. And that was for you a, a boundary condition on, yes. on friendship and loyalty to friends? Because if he'd said, oh, come on, I didn't really mean to say you were a racist, that would have maybe respected me even less, because a word like that can't be used lightly. It has to, it has to hold its full value. It has to hold the, the complete uh, uh, integrity of its coinage. If a word like that becomes cheap and we've all lost a very important term of condemnation, and it, would, it just becomes vulgar abuse, and then a whole compass point has been abolished. So I think that has to be, that boundary has to be patrolled, as all boundaries of meaning have to be patrolled, very rigorously. Yeah, I do. Do you think that Orientalism stands up well today? I think it's a, it will always be thought of as a book that made people think about, the, about the, their position in the world, just the name itself. I mean, the way we call it the Near East or the Middle East. You know, it's not the Middle East except if you live in a certain quarter of the world. I, I always use the example of, do, do people here still read Robert Hughes, great Australian art critic? Used to be the only reason to read Time magazine. Well, anyway, a great marsupial, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Hughes, and <coughs> brought up in Australia, where he couldn't help noticing that his family, <coughs> who were very anglicized, would refer to Indonesia, for example, um, as the Far East, when it was, in fact, their immediate north. <laughs> so the shift in perspective that Edward tried to impose was good. 
but he was very, very, very limited in who he blamed for this kind of thing. And he basically thought that the only racists or colonialists in the world were the British and the French, and this isn't quite true. You were... But it's a good starting point. There's a very good commentary and critique of it uh, by Ibn Warak called Defending the West, a very scrupulous reading of Edward's um, primary sources and uh, commentaries, and an extremely good rebuttal of a lot of it. I mean, to give one example that I made, I used myself, I mean, Edward says that Germany, German Orientalism doesn't quite count in the same way as French and British. Um, German Oriental scholarship wasn't directed at the foundation of an empire in, in the Levant. Or, well, it, well, that's only true if you forget that Germany had an alliance with the Turkish Ottoman Empire and was trying to build a Berlin-Baghdad railway for the Kaiser, and that the last time there was a jihad proclaimed, real serious one in the world, was in 1914 by the Caliphate against Britain, um, where they lost not just the war, but the, their whole empire. And that's what bin Laden is still fighting to get back. Uh, that explains a lot, um, and Edward leaves all that out, so, which I would regard as a criticism. The take heart, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, all proclaimed jihads have always failed, and always will, because they all demand the impossible. And so in the end, what will happen to the people who proclaim them is they'll start cutting each other's throats, because someone hasn't been godly enough in the ranks, and they need, we need to renew our commitment to suicide and self-destruction. So if you hold, so there's no point in saying, let's pretend that there's a spiritual side to this. So just wait it out, keep your secular and materialist powder dry, be proud of the tradition of reason and, and science, and resolve not to give one, one inch to it. In particular, <laughs> thank you. In particular, don't give it what it always demands so promiscuously, respect. They say you should respect, no, no, don't. Don't respect it. No respect. And as living proof that jihad must fail, Ibn Wark is, Ibn Wark, if you don't know, is most famous as the author of Why I'm Not a Muslim and yes, the originator is. of really the entire apostate well, He's written a movement. shelf of books that everyone here should have. Yeah. He is uh, alive and with us in temple tonight. Oh, superb. <laughs> Could I ask you to read there, just to the end? We are, we are now going to open the floor to your questions, and Mr. Hitchens is going to prepare us for that with a brief reading. Which bit, sorry? So every, oh. mm -hmm. All right. Um, every article and review and book that I've ever published has constituted an appeal to the personal persons to whom I should have talked before I dared to write it. I never launch any little essay without the hope and the fear, because the encounter may also be embarrassing, that I shall draw a letter that begins, Dear Mr. Hitchens, it seems that you are unaware that... It is in this sense that authorship is collaborative with the reader. That's their cue? Okay. In that Thank spirit, you. in the spirit of collaboration, here's a question for Oh, are you the ventriloquist? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't trust them, in other words. <laughs> from Tim, a psychiatry resident at Harvard Medical School. Yes. Definitely not to be trusted. What advice can you give those of us aspiring to be the next generation of future leaders in the atheist movement? Don't have any advice. So the great thing about being an atheist is you don't have to join anything. <laughs> and you... Imagine saying five times a day, isn't this God business bullshit, you know? <laughs> Once and pointing in the right direction to say it. You know. <laughs> Once a century is enough for that. And then you get on with your life. The whole point is to stay out late on Friday do, night and your sleep own, in late on Sunday do morning. Your, do your own thinking. I mean, I, it's, it's an interesting question as to whether there sh is or should be a movement. I guess there should be one, but, but there's, there's, a, there's an irony lurking there somewhere. 
If there's an irony lurking there, I'm sure you will find it. If the overthrow of Saddam Hussein's dictatorship was an ethical act or moral imperative, what of all the other despots in the world shall we overthrow them all? Who's next? Michael Nord, Columbia. Yes. Well, the reverse conditions under which the law says a government has lost its sovereignty and can be subject to international intervention. Very quickly, um, invading and occupying the territory of neighboring states, committing genocide, especially if you are signatory as we are of the Genocide Convention, which mandates action to either to prevent or if it can't be prevented, to punish genocide. Um, violations of the principles or practices of the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty and giving aid and comfort and material help to international terrorist nihilist organizations. So Iraq is the only, Saddam Hussein's Iraq is the only case I know which broke all those several times and intended to go on doing so if it, if it had survived. Iran meets two or three of those and wants to meet another. In other words, it wants, it wants the illegal weapons and is already sponsoring the illegal international theocratic terrorist groups in order to invade and occupy the territory of neighbors down there. It has a clear and stated intention of taking over Bahrain, Dubai, and possibly Saudi Arabia and other neighboring Sunni Arab territories. So you can see it developing right in front of you. Has not yet violated the Genocide Convention, however. <coughs> the worst place in the world is North Korea, by far. Also the most worshipful state in the world, the most deistic state in the world. Actually, when I was young, shall I just quickly tell you about North Korea? When I was young, they made me attend chapel, which I'm glad they did every day. I learned a lot from it. I could easily imagine what hell would be like. I could do that sort of without being told, in a sense. But I could never imagine what heaven would be like. It was very interesting that no Christian has ever managed to come up with a good description, except that of eternal praise, unending praise, round the clock, full time praise and thanksgiving forever. And you think, not only would, does that sound like hell, <laughs> but, it, but also it sounds, or it sounds somehow impossible. And who would want to just be the recipient of this? The Godhead, surely after the first 10 billion years of it, would get, even he'd get bored with it. <laughs> so the mind became a blank at this point. Couldn't form a conception of it. In North Korea, I've seen it done. That's what it is to be North Korean, is to be starved and terrified and asked to be, and asked to be grateful for it and thank the, the divine leader for it, round the clock. Um, if you think about it, North Korea is a weird place. Its um, president is a dead man, for one thing. Kim Jong-il is still the president of North Korea. He's been dead for 15 years. It's a necrocracy. <laughs> or than thanatocracy, mausolocracy. And his son, the dear leader, the scrawny little runt we have now, is considered to be his reincarnation. So you see where I'm going with this. You don't, I don't, you don't need any prompting. They're just one short of a trinity now. It's the most perfectly religious state I've ever seen. It's reduced the size of its population by six inches in the last couple of decades. That's a, you have to starve people really brutally to do that. And all the surplus has gone on building illegal, illegal nuclear weapons. And we're all hostages of their slave system because they will starve their slaves more if we aren't nice to them. And if we're mean to them, they'll explode a nuclear weapon. So you should worry more about the countries you can't do anything about than the ones that you can, because they're in your future. I went to North Korea determined that I wouldn't use the term 1984 in my report. <laughs> whatever, whatever happens, I'm not going to do it. I'd once gone to Prague under the communist regime and thought, whatever happens, I'm not going to mention Kafka. <laughs> I'm going to be the first writer who doesn't put Kafka in his Prague delegate. And I went to this opposition meeting, which I thought was well protected and completely secret, but the p secret police knew about it and they broke in and slammed me against the wall and said, you're under arrest. And I said, what for? And they said, we don't have to tell you that. And I thought, fuck. 
the make you mention Kafka. The great, the great, <laughs> the great thing about totalitarianism is it is a cliche. It's a terrible totalitarianism is a terrible bore. It's a cliche in itself. It rings cliches out of you. Of course, I had to say 1984 once I was in Pyongyang. You can't not do it. It's actually. But the Big Brother problem is the problem we're all united about here. That's the problem to begin with, is the wish for a large, supreme, anonymous bully to take your responsibilities away from you. That is, that's the problem to begin with. It's a criticism that recurs throughout the book of totalitarian regimes. They're just too dull for They're you. They're dull, yeah. Imagine what Persia could be like, was like, mm. and what it's like now. Speaking of Persia, <laughs> Here is a, a question from um, someone from what is arguably the most secular humanist uh, population on earth, um, an Iranian. Yes. An Iranian socialist and atheist. Uh, I was wondering if you would comment on the trend among Western leftists to side with Islamism over socialist and Marxist parties in the Middle East, from Arash Karimi. Yeah, if it's one of the most depressing of recent phenomena, I think. I mean, I can quite see why hundreds of thousands of people would feel impelled, say, to fill the streets um, for a policy that would, in effect, have kept Saddam Hussein in power. I wouldn't have done it myself. Thank you very much. Um, but there would, there would be no demonstration in favor, say, of the secular Kurdish leftist parties in Iraq. No, there's what, demonstration of solidarity with the Kurds. Not one. Not one ever. That's shameful, I think. Absolutely shameful. Um, I, the American campuses are not that hard to hold demonstrations on. Except for demonstrations by Iranian students, I have not seen a mass demonstration in favor of the Iranian democracy movement at all ever. And I think that's a great source of shame as well. And I have a feeling, and it's only a feeling, but it's a very strong one, that um, in some part of the liberal and left uh, awareness, there's a feeling that people who, in countries like this, who opposition movements that look upon the United States with a friendly eye, which most of the Iranian opposition does, are somehow inauthentic. They can't be kosher if they're like that. And I think that's a very sick and masochistic feeling and needs to be rooted out. And it really alarms me, for example, that a, a, a goodly proportion of what seems to me to be the American liberal conscience regards um, the Turkish fundamentalist sponsorship of a racist totalitarian party in Gaza as a progressive movement. And never, say, never, has, never says a word about the struggles of the PLO, my old friends in the PLO, to try and build up a society on the West Bank and to begin as they are doing, to lay the foundations of a state there. That's somehow, that's not exciting. That, that isn't, there are not enough Kalashnikovs on the t-shirt there. This is a disgusting and um, promiscuous attitude, I think. Do you have an opinion? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> not always. About the Cordoba Initiative? I think there are already too many houses of worship in New York City. And I don't think a house of worship is at all the apt means of memorializing, commemorating, annealing, whatever word you want, the corpses of thousands of people who were killed by uh, a faith-based terrorist organization. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, if what I've read is true about the supposedly sponsoring imam of this mosque, who didn't believe that Al-Qaeda had blown up the World Trade Center in the first place. I don't know that what I've read about him is correct, but it wouldn't be the first time this has happened. Then I don't know what he's doing in New York in the first place. And the third thing is that he's got, apparently at present, um, 50 grand or something to spend on this shopfront mosque, but the idea is for an Islamic center that will cost something like 50 million. I'd be very interested to know where that money is coming from. Right. And I'm practically sure I can tell you. And as, again, I don't think I'm ready for any more Saudi madrasas in the United States. 
or anything remotely resembling it. I think the, the money that Saudi Arabia is allowed to spend here is, is disgraceful and insufficiently supervised, and that there should be no more Saudi money spent on, for example, distributing extremist Qurans in our prison system, along with extremist imams to work on violent prisoners. Um, no more of that. No more, not, not another dime of Saudi money spent in that way in this country, at least until we're allowed to open the Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson Center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I, my, my experience is this, with any thinking person of any faith, you've got a much better chance of convincing them of the non-existence of the supernatural, the truth of science and reason, than you do of converting them to a whole other religion, which isn't much progress in any case. So the fact is, I think the problem is the other way. Everywhere I know about in Europe, which is where she's been talking, the Christian church is holding the door open for the Islamists all the time. Who in Britain says it's time we had Sharia law for Muslims only, so that it's no longer true in England that the law covers everybody in the same way? Special courts for Muslims. The Archbishop of Canterbury is for that. Because they think the enemy, and they're right, the enemy is secularism. And any faith is better than none. They make it absolutely plain. Look what happened when the Ayatollah tried to murder Salman. The uh, Cardinal Archbishop of New York, O'Connor at the time, His Holiness the Pope, the chief uh, Sephardic rabbi of Israel, and the Archbishop of Canterbury all made statements in solidarity with Khomeini. Not what, with the murder uh, directly, but saying the problem was not the offer of money for murder, the problem was a blasphemous novel. This is what I call reverse ecumenicism. Mm -hmm. When the real principles uh, are down, they all, these guys will all stick together, as they will at the UN on women's rights, or gay rights, for example. They are, they are all... They're all part of the same flock of crows, as far as I can see. And I say the hell with it. <laughs> now, Sam Harris famously has a soft spot for Buddhism or some meditative traditions. Question. I heard that Sam Harris disagreed with your view of Buddhism and that the two of you were due to meet so that he could, quote, enlighten you on the subject. Did this discussion take place yet? And if so, have you changed your view of Buddhism in any way? Um, you know what the Buddhist says to the hot dog vendor, don't you? Tell me. You know what? What does the Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Don't you hear me? Make me one with everything. Do you know what the Buddhist says to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. That's only part one. That's part one. The slathered dog is given to the Buddhist by the hot dog vendor, and the Buddhist hands over a $20 bill, starts to munch, nothing happens. Munches again, nothing happens. He says to the vendor, what about my change? And the hot dog vendor says, change comes only from within. <laughs> um, if Sam Harris thinks there's anything to be said for Buddhist meditative practice, then, then yes, it's true, I did say, I would love to have a talk with him about it. I mean, if, if, if that's his view, I'd like to hear it better elaborated. We haven't had that moment yet. I was sent by its author a recent book called Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist. I'm sorry I don't remember his name. The book is now out. It's very good. It's the memoir of, of a, a European who spent a great deal of time in Korea, in Burma, in Sri Lanka, in Tibet, really mastering Buddhist practice and um, meditation and all of these things. And he says that it, it would be possible, because Buddhism, after all, claims not to be a religion, to make it into a useful spiritual practice or some such, on the condition that they repudiated the two great things, things that make it cruel, <coughs> cruel and stupid, which is the theory, theory, the claim of reincarnation and the general theory of the Dharma. So if you could purge it of these accretions of, of bar barbaric stupidity, then the thing could, could be um, decultified, if you like. Okay, that kind of thing, as Thomas Jefferson says, 
and neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Let them try it if they want. But I think probably the thing that uh, Sam is advancing, wants to discuss where I wouldn't, be quali wouldn't consider myself qualified is in his work as a, as a neuroscientist and, and in the question of whether there can be a cognition uh, independent of the brain. And that's a very fascinating subject, but I really don't dare to pronounce on it. I suspect not, but I'm not going to be drawn onto territory where I'm not qualified. Well, I dare say we are running out of time. Ah, I wanted to thank everyone. I barely got my trousers off. <laughs> I, you know, I have, I have got some Robert Ludlum versions of, um, of your book. I wanted to try out. Please, on, would you indulge yeah. me? Just a few. We've got um, the Christopher identity, <laughs> the Amos papers, mm -hmm. the Mesopotamian vindication. Yes. Pan, uh, panned by your critics as the Baghdad intransigency. <laughs> and of course, my personal favorite, the Oxbridge buggery. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary.
two matches in the round.